Hi, kitty cats. Did you know the typical human is genetically 99.4% identical to the reference genome used by the Human Genome Project? That's 99.4% identical with every human, and this regardless of sex, race, or country of origin. Now, given that statistic, is there any merit to the claim male bodies are different from female bodies? Or is science just being perverted for political control yet again? Well, let's find out. The 2024 Olympics in Paris were marred by false accusations against two athletes, both of whom were assigned female at birth. The accusation claimed both females were transgender, or assigned male at birth, which conferred an unfair advantage in competition. Now, the basis for the claim was nothing more than a visual inspection, made not by experts, but by conservative loudmouth media darlings Elon Musk and J.K. Rowling, both well-known critics of transgender people. Now, Musk and Rowling have been rewarded for their whistleblowing efforts with a lawsuit, alleging cyber harassment. Imane Khalif, who filed the lawsuit, is prepared to defend her genetics in court against what amounts to poor science and a lack of understanding regarding human biochemistry. Where do Musk, Rowling, and others of their ilk go wrong? The real science begins with the human genome. The human genome is composed of a total of 23 pairs of chromosomes, displayed graphically here. Remember, each of us is 99.4% identical with a reference human genome. Most of the genome, pairs 1 through 22, are called allosomes because they are shared among every human. But a major part of conservative rhetoric claiming sex and gender are identical alleges male biochemistry is fundamentally different from female biochemistry. So what part of the human genome differs between male and female genotypes? Just this guy, the Y chromosome. One chromosome in the pair labeled pair 23. Given the claim male biochemistry fundamentally differs from female biochemistry, the Y chromosome must play a huge part in biology, right? Actually, no. The Y chromosome contains only around 100 genes out of approximately 20,000 identified in the human genome. And of those 100 genes, only around 25 are even important, and many of those are also redundant across the allosomes. From the standpoint of genetics, redundancy is important. The way the Y chromosome is utilized in meiosis to produce gametes, sperm in this case, makes it resistant to the process of natural selection. That is, evolution overlooks the Y chromosome, and as a result, it houses a significant proportion of what is called junk DNA. So what does the Y chromosome do? Well, primarily it contains the SRY gene, the sex-determining region of the Y chromosome. This gene codes a protein, the SRY protein, associated with a high probability of the embryo developing male reproductive organs. Of course, as with all genetics, it isn't quite as simple as that. Scientists have observed the SRY gene translocate to other genes, even allosomes. Geneticists believe the Y chromosome will one day evolve out of the human genome altogether. So if the Y chromosome does so little, why do we observe such diversity among humans, including the structural differences between the sexes? It doesn't take much of a scientist to observe the differences in human physical structure, particularly between male bodies and female bodies. This diversity is caused by the differences between the reference human genome, which describes the human species as a whole, and the individual genotype each of us inherits through our parents. Again, the average difference between the reference genome and our individual genotype is only 0.6%. But that level of difference is enough to account for all diversity observed in sex and race across the human species. Almost all the diversity is driven not by pair 23, the sex chromosomes, but by the allosomes, pairs 1 through 22. In fact, pair 23 doesn't even contain complete genetic information to develop primary or secondary sex characteristics. Each of us carries the information to develop both male and female reproductive parts, regardless of what pair 23 contains. So if the X and Y chromosomes don't drive this diversity of physical structure, what does? 
Within the human genome is a highly interrelated set of biochemical pathways encoded across pairs 1 through 23. Each of us carries the entire set of pathways specified in the human genome. Our individual differences in genotype determines the level of expression of an interrelation among the pathways. In particular, the sex hormones favor expression and interrelation of certain pathways over others. Of the entire set of pathways, testosterone favors a certain set of pathways, and estrogen favors another certain set of pathways. Some of them are exclusive, but many of them are not. If every human body is capable of expressing any biochemical pathway in the human genome, how do sex hormones help determine what is favored? The biggest factor is the predominant sex hormone the body experiences. In human development, an embryo does not develop male or female reproductive parts directly as a result of its genetics. Instead, the embryo responds to the hormone balance in the environment of the mother's uterus. Remember that SRY gene and the SRY protein? The mother is stimulated by SRY protein to generate more testosterone, and that causes the embryo to respond and develop male reproductive parts. Without that testosterone from the mother, the embryo will develop female reproductive parts, because estrogen is the predominant sex hormone the embryo experiences. Now, after birth, human bodies look pretty similar, so long as you don't go searching for genitalia. It isn't until puberty hits that bodies differentiate greatly. Why is this? because our bodies begin to create higher concentrations of sex hormone on their own, and the biochemistry simply responds. I want to emphasize that point. The body responds to hormone concentrations. Each of us has all the pathways. Each of us can operate all the pathways. But some of them are favored depending upon the balance of sex hormones. What if the balance changes after puberty? In gender-affirming hormone replacement therapy, such as I received, the predominant sex hormone testosterone was replaced by estrogen, and, as a result, my body responded. Fat redistributed to give me a curvier backside and face, I developed breasts, body hair growth slowed, muscle mass decreased. All of these secondary sex characteristics changed in response to the sex hormone my body experienced. Now, did I grow new primary sex characteristics? No. There is a limit to the response the human body can make, and I was past the point where I could achieve that without surgery. But the takeaway point is that human biochemistry depends greatly on relative concentrations of sex hormones, as well as our personal sensitivity to each sex hormone. The genetics is simply a framework within which to express biochemical pathways. To return to genetics and sports performance, human development occurs not because of fundamental differences in genetics, but because of standard differences in sex hormone balance and individual sensitivity to each sex hormone. This means there are humans, assigned male at birth, who express typically feminine physical characteristics. And there are humans assigned female at birth who express typically masculine physical characteristics. Now, as an example, I used to be a runner. I ran the 2002 Los Angeles Marathon, and I finished in something like 19,000th place. Many of the 19,000 people who finished before I did were assigned female at birth. They were better runners despite me being assigned male at birth. Their bodies were better suited to running a marathon than mine was. And that isn't a fundamental difference in genetics. It was individual expression of pathways more favorable than mine for running. Imane Khalif expresses pathways more favorable for boxing than others in the 2024 Paris Olympics. In fact, despite me being assigned male at birth, I have little doubt Imane could knock my ass out. If you're watching this, Imane, I'm not asking you to. Just saying. I don't have all of the answers for how sporting organizations should address the subject of sex and gender in competition. Boxing already uses categories by weight, so boxers compete based on a measure of capability, not sex or gender. And perhaps that is the better answer, to treat humans only as humans, not as involuntary representatives of a sex or a gender. 
Believe me, there would not be a sudden influx of men into floor gymnastics. Simone Biles is as good as she is for a reason. And only some of that has to do with the physical structure endowed by her genetics. So now, let's hear from you. What aspects of your physical structure deviate from your sex assigned at birth? Does that make you more or less of the person you are? Tell me in the comments below, and then subscribe to my channel for more gender education from a human perspective. Talk soon. Bye.